after last week's studio lock-in. We're back again, but the good news is you won't just be listening to us waffling on for an hour or so. The special guest slot is back, and this week's a cracker. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. The smashy and nicey of the crime podcast world. Well, why not? Well, why not? We've got to, got to inject some, some life into this subject matter somehow, haven't we? Absolutely, matey. Uh, <laughs> well, we need here to get we some are. jingles made up. Oh, that's a very good idea. <laughs> Can you do those on your you know, your wizard box over there? Um, with... I wouldn't want to, no, but I know plenty of people who could. Yeah, oh, goodness me. Jingles. <laughs> Have you got any jingles? No, I always walk this way. <laughs> There we go. The old ones are always the all, worst. All, all the old jokes as well. I can hear you all groaning from here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, back, back to crime. Back to crime. Yes. Um, one thing I, I was going to bring up this week, I was looking for crime fiction stuff in the news, as I do, about ten minutes before you turn up, and I panic that we've got nothing to talk about. <laughs> and um, one thing I did see in the news um, was uh, an article uh, advertising the new Nio Marsh book. Yes. Um, which would be fascinating at the best of times, but is even more impressive considering she's been dead for 35 years. It's pretty good going. It's not bad. Yeah, she still managed to finish a book um, with the considerable help of uh, Stella Duffy, a UK-based novelist and theatre maker. Um, yeah, it's, it's something I wanted to bring up because it's been done before. The Agatha, uh, Agatha Christie books has been more written by, by Sophie Hannah. Um, Steve Larson's uh, Millennium books were continued by his um, his widow, I believe. Oh, yes, indeed. And Felix Francis, uh, who took over writing uh, the books of his father. Mm. And mother, Sebastian Fox, does uh, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, Jeeves yeah, and yeah. Worcester. We've got um, Anthony Horowitz. Of course, uh, yeah, yes. yeah, the Bond. Uh, does the Bond franchise. Yeah. So, yes, it's become a, sort of an accepted uh, way of keeping, and I hate the word franchise, I wish there was another way, a series of of characters live. I mean, it, it, it depends how it's done. I mean, with writers of that uh, uh, quality, they've succeeded because, one, they're great writers in their own right, and they're actually dealing in, uh, with wonderful characters created by other great writers. So that handover seems to work very successfully. It, it raises lots of questions. I mean, what is and who is an author if you put some books out with your name on them um your your perception as an author is that you write those books and they go out and when you die that's it but somebody else continuing on that legacy um you know what what is the author is it just a name is it just a a brand name what's well this brings up the question that uh, comes up very often uh, certainly at literary festivals that i go to uh you have the the mighty here comes the word again franchises of of some people like james patterson who uh who writes his books they his name at the top of them but very often they are written in mm. with some uh, other 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 person some people may even say well, that's completely by thing, another writer it? when when the writer is still alive yes that's... guiding the fra- guiding his characters and his stories through yeah. keeping an overall i suppose it's like being an executive producer on a, a television uh, uh, series or a film uh, and you've written the first episode and you bring on a team of other writers or a, another writer to actually continue the series because obviously you've got other things to do so i suppose yes that's that's probably more like it um but I've read uh, the, the Sophie, Han- Sophie Hanna, I mentioned that the other week, uh, which I thought was, you know, terrific, absolutely mm. wonderful. I've read Sebastian uh, Fox's um, P.G. Woodhouse, which is, you know, again, uh, you'd be hard pushed to to spot the difference. I'm sure absolutely ardent fans mm. of of uh, Plum Woodhouse would actually say, ah, 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 ah. But uh, to the layman like myself, um, it's still a great story and uh, well, you know, you recreating characters that I love. Woodhouse yourself. Well, yes, I having, am. having I, been I, in the TV series for, uh, I, yes, for a I, while, I, you should. Uh... I have to say, I do know a fair bit about Peter Woodhouse. I don't know much about. It much else it has to be said but I do know a lot about them and I, I do think Sebastian Fox does a, a, a superb job Well um, hopefully the, the Naya Marsh um, story, a new book um, with Stella Duffy Money in the Morgue um, hopefully we'll be focusing on that a little more in, uh, in in weeks to come Well hopefully very soon we may have something of mm. a Partners in Crime special. Yes we'll, uh, we'll keep quiet on that for now um, I have been doing a little bit of TV watching in the last week or two. I've been watching a series on Netflix called Manhunt Una Bomber. Oh, um, have you heard of it? No. 
It's um, according to Wikipedia, it depicts a fictionalized account of the F- FBI's hunt for the Unabomber. Um, it premiered on the Discovery Channel uh, August last year and has now been showing on Netflix. Um, it's, it's it's excellent. It's, um, it's it's really interesting. It throws up some really um, fascinating. Um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for now. Themes, I suppose. Uh, themes. Other than, other than just the hunt for for this bomber who has been. Um, he sort of terrorised large amounts of the United States yes, um, it is. over over a course of years, and it's 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 a fascinating look into the the investigation and all the mistakes that were made early on, and how this new guy comes in and kind of changes the way it's done. Um, but yeah, I, I would I would highly recommend it. I think Rotten Tomatoes give it a ninety two percent approval rating. Well, go from them. That's that's, um, that's that's brilliant. Yes, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it, so it's an investigation, obviously, into the Unibomber. Now, I always get confused, mm-hmm. and I read a, a lot of American um, crime drama as well. But it, it still surprises me how little I know about the different. Uh, w- uh, policing uh, levels there are the the federal level, the mm. local level, the different forces that are all involved. There always seems to be in any film or something a clash yeah. between the FBI coming into the local guys and the local guys resenting uh, the FBI coming in or some other b- b- sort of national force coming in to take over. Um, it's a very complicated. Well, mm. our American listeners will say. Of course it's not. It's very simple, you idiot. <laughs> but to me, it's a very complicated uh, situation. Maybe we've got the similar thing over here, I guess. We, we have. It well, does, we do. We have the National Crime Agency. We do um, indeed, yes. Which is a slightly different thing um, to the, the, kind of the British FBI, which was, it was touted as when it, when it first launched. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the FBI are the, the people in charge here in the, the Unabomber series, mainly because it's, it was something that, um, I believe, spanned numerous states. Um, of course, the FBI is a federal organisation. That's what the F stands for. So, yeah, they're they're the they're the lead investigators in this series. Right. It's, I um, see. Yeah, highly highly recommended. Manhunt Unibomber. Unibomber. Yeah, great great series that. Okay. Well, listen. My recommendation is a book. It is a book. Oh, uh, a and book. it's uh, and I've just caught what up with this one. A book. A book. <laughs> listen, listen to it. Ooh, That's the many pages. Sounds better than Netflix. It's very good. Um, that was the book, by the way, not me. Um, <laughs> yes, well, I'm just catching up with uh, a book that was called The Most Exciting Debut Thriller of the Year, Last Year. Here we are, finger on the pulse. <laughs> um, it's only May. It's, we're still in the first half of the year. And of course, that's a that's a sort of a, a marketing line that is, is used pretty often. But uh, I, I'm not surprised it was used on this. It's called um, Rattle uh, by Fiona Cummins, um, and uh, it's been described as uh, uh, amid the outpouring of crime novels, Rattle is up there with the best of them, said the Times. Uh, also, uh, an excellent read, Martina Cole and Val McDermott. Uh, it's a rare debut that has this much polish head and shoulders above most of the competition. So, yes, I mean, great acclaim uh, for this book. It is a classic serial killer investigation. Um, and our guest today is uh, obviously uh, um, a, a, a psychological mm. uh, thriller writer. And I was throwing up this question of the difference between those two genres, uh, one being a sort of more based on focused on the uh, uh, police uh, investigation, the investigation of the crime, and the psychological drama, uh, focusing pretty much on the, uh, the personal domestic uh, protagonists, the people who have actually suffered the crimes or are about to suffer the crimes. But anyway, this is a smashing read. I'll just read you the bump at the back because I love bumps at the back. I think that they're, they're great because sometimes they're absolutely rubbish, And uh, but this is rather good. He leads an ordinary life some of the time. He has a past which explains his behaviour most of the time. He has a hobby too terrible to understand all of the time. Etta is a detective who suspects him. Erdman and Lilith are parents who fear him, and Jakey and Clara have something he craves. The collector has come to rattle their bones, and he won't stop until he's caught. Well, there we are. <laughs> I, do uh, lo- I do love it when you use your TV commercial voiceover voice. Oh, that wasn't my TV commercial. Well, that was my getting out of bed in the morning <coughs> voice. That wasn't the uh, one you used for the guide dogs. Uh, no, no, it wasn't the one I used for the guide dogs. Donate to guide dogs. 
Um, <laughs> even that wasn't the one I used for that. Um, anyway, Man of Many Voices, Master of None. It's a great book. It's uh, Fiona Cummings. It's uh, published uh, by Pan in in, uh, in book form and in ebook form. Uh, will be available, of course, on Kobo. So rattle Fiona Cummings, the most exciting debut thriller of the year, last year. Well, finger on the pulse, as always. If you want to get hold of a copy of Rattle by Fiona Cummins, why not go to Kobo.com and get your copy now. If you've not bought a book from Kobo before, you can read it on any device you like. You don't need a special e-reader. You can read it on your smartphone, on your tablet, or even on your computer, whatever you're listening to this podcast through. Uh, go to Kobo.com, find Rattle by Fiona Cummins, and enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout, and the very nice folks at Kobo will give you 90% off of that book just for being a lovely listener to Partners in Crime. <whistles> K.L. Slater's psychological thrillers have sold over 900,000 copies in total, with translation rights sold in eight countries around the world. Her latest book, The Visitor, has recently been published by Bookature. Uh, now, Kim, the story behind your success is, is unique and inspiring, but like many other Bookature authors, it, it involves overcoming years of rejection and never giving up hope, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, um, it really does. And um, mine's a really long story of publication, um, years and years of trying to be published until uh, I sort of thought, well, I think I'm going to have to do something different here because, um, you know, I was keeping on keeping on, as you do. And I was sending out um, I was sending out my 10 uh, chapters and a covering letter because that's what it was like in those days. <laughs> Back in the day, uh, there wasn't much emailed stuff out. And, um, you know, with alarming regularity, the rejection envelope would slip back through the door. But um, so uh, I decided to go back to university at the age of 40. And, um, and I did an English and creative writing degree. And I always wrote adult crime. Adult crime was my first love as such. Uh, but when I was, I, I did my degree and then uh, I did a, a master's degree in creative writing because I just loved it so much. And, um, and on that, I wrote a young adult story and I developed that into a novel. And I first got published with Macmillan Children's Books um, uh, with the young adult. Our first book was called Smart. So I kind of focused on that for a while, and that was one book a year. And then I was working as well in the day job, um, and I was writing in the morning, six to eight, before I went to work. And um, I decided that I was going to give it a go and, tr you know, try and become a full-time writer. But really to do that, I knew I needed another genre um, to, to do because I, I knew I could write more. So I tried again with my first adult crime book, which was called Safe With Me. And it was a psychological thriller. And it, it was my dissertation uh, for my um, English and creative writing degree. So the first sort of like 15,000 words or so of Safe With Me was my dissertation. And that was in, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about dates. I think it's 2010. And that's really before psychological thrillers um, got so popular, I think. Or they were you just were like, a visionary then. I was a bit of a visionary, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I realized... Did Did you mean to write a psychological thriller? Or I mean, for, for me, when I did my first one, um, I I didn't actually know what a psychological thriller was. I had the idea for a book, and it it turned out it was a psychological thriller, and it, it turned out they were popular. And me not having my finger on the pulse at all didn't know that. Was it Was it a similar thing for you, or or did you kind of set out to to write this specific style? No, I mean, as you said, psychological thriller became sort of like a bit of a buzz word, didn't it? Buzz phrase. Um, but um, when I was on my, when I was doing my English and creative writing degree, obviously on the English side of things, we were analysing books and writing essays. And um, and I read a book called The Collector, which um, the author's <laughs> name is escaping me at this precise moment. It is on my bookshelf somewhere. Um, his first name is John. John Banville. Banville. Was it? Oh, was it John? John John Fowles, the collector. The collector uh, is it John Fowles? I, John... I don't know. I think I think it I think it was I think it possibly was. Yes, for a French lieutenant's woman okay. and, and, and the Magus. It, it um, was the collector. John Fowles. Yes. Yeah, John did, Fowles. Yes. Just had a quick. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I haven't I've read it years ago. But that that was it's Bob here, by the way. Hello, Kim. Um, Hi, Bob. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I, so that that sort of inspired you, did it? I'm a great writer, one of my all time favourites, and uh, that book is a is a is an intriguing book, really, and weaving that sort of suspense and various other things in a non traditional way that Fowles used to use. He used it in the in the, in the, in the Majorson uh, and lots of other uh, of his of his works too. So that inspired you. It definitely did, and. Um... Bit like Adam said, I didn't kind of set out to write that um, sort of book. I'd, I was a massive crime reader anyway. Um, yeah, I've always been a, a, a reader across all genres, but I loved crime and still do. Uh, but when I read The Collector, I found a, a genre there that, you know, that sort of slow building dread, um, uh, strange characters, uh, I, I found that more exciting than the... Uh, the more sort of police procedural even or you know blood and guts type thing i really enjoyed the psychological element so that's what inspired my uh, dissertation um, and and that was the beginnings of safe with me but then it went in the draw then for quite a few years because uh, then i was concentrating on young adult you know because that's what had got me published after many years um so yeah that's uh would you recommend that, that, that? I mean, where where do you read for your uh, uh, your creative writing course? Was that uh, was that locally? Was that in Nottingham? Was that? Uh... It was Nottingham Trent University. Yes. And would you, would you recommend that path to 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 people? Because you know, I, it's it takes a lot of of dedication. I mean, to write a book it does it anyway, but to actually just say, right, I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to start from scratch, scratch, as it were, and I'm going to spend four or five years, I believe, uh, uh, sort of learning uh, the craft of creative writing, uh, so I can come back uh, uh, bigger and stronger, as it were. So you would recommend that path to people who are sort of uh, thinking of writing their uh, uh, creatively. Absolutely, I, yeah. I really would, but not everybody can do it. It is a massive commitment, and for various reasons, not every, it's not the path for everyone. Um, but um, the thing is with me is I've always been a bit of a lifelong learner, so I've always enjoyed developing any skills or anything I'm interested in. So I was kind of a, a lifelong learner to start with. And it was a case with me of I did believe in myself, but of course it's a roller coaster like everyone experiences when you're trying to get published almost the hardest thing is not to keep writing but to keep up your belief in yourself and try not to let the rejections get you down or to get back up rather you know so for me it was a case of, of thinking what could I do that could was was a different kind of action and that I that would help me ultimately get published but that you know I, I just really it really appealed to me because I finished my education when I was 18 at A levels and then I went into work, um, into accountancy, actually, but uh, working with numbers. But what I always say to people is I would absolutely recommend uh, if you could do in a degree or master's. It gives you the time and the space to develop your writing and to write things. You can get in a bit of a rut with your writing. I'd never written Young Adult before. Didn't think I'd enjoy it. In actual fact, I really loved it. Um, but I say to people, there's lots of other things you can do. You can join a writing group to get that sort of critical analysis and to get used to people reading your writing and not feel so perhaps uh, defensive about it because I think you put something of yourself into writing or you know there's like Arvon or, or even online courses or there's lots of workshops now that you uh, that you can um, that you can go on or enjoy so all of that stuff I think helps inspire and also keep you going keep you getting up keep you believing that it can happen because that's just important. Well, it is. I mean, that's, that's, that's wonderfully said. Because, you know, there are probably uh, many listeners to this podcast who are uh, at the stage that you were before you went on that creative course, you know, writing, wanting to write books, wanting to get uh, get your voice out there. Um, and, and I guess it's a question of lots of other things. You know, you, people have lots of different commitments. Some people just can't uh, uh, commit to a, sort of a, an education uh, like that because of work and lack of money and various other things. How did you manage to do it? must have taken an awful lot of of organization and logistical the logistical challenge of just sort of fitting it into uh the rest of a, 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 i presume a very busy life 
Yes, it was. Um, but I think I wanted to do it so much. I mean, I was what, what it was, my daughter, Francesca, she, at the time, she was looking at doing her own A-levels and she brought home her course stuff. And, and it kind of, um, it, it just kind of occurred to me that this was a really good time for me. Now, she was of an age, you know, that she didn't need me as much. Um, I was self-employed. So although I was working full time in Nottingham inner city schools, mainly doing um, school budgets, accounts um the thing is with the english and creative writing degree it was six hours lecture time but about 40 hours reading and writing essays at nights and weekends so being self-employed made it a little bit easier i could sort my diary so that i was available for those lectures it was something that i just felt really driven and excited to do it was cheap as chips it was only three grand a year Wow. <laughs> 29 grand a year like it is now mm. yeah so um you know it, i was in a position i was very fortunate that i could make the adjustments i needed in order to do that course but of course but the drive what got me through it was the drive and the belief that this was going to help me in my lifelong dream um and when i came to do the masters uh, you know, that gave me the time and space to try and write different things. I did screenwriting. Um, I did writing for children and young adults. I did poetry. I did fiction. And I've used all of those things. I, in my young adult, one of my young adult books, um, the, the boy in it, the main character, he wants to be a, a, a film uh, writer, a, a screenwriter. You know, and I use my, my, my knowledge of scripts and that from my my masters so it all came in i used my um, dissertation formed my first uh young uh, sorry my first adult crime thriller safe with me so i've used all of those bits it's been uh it, absolutely i would i would recommend um but as i say it's also you know fostering that belief that you can do it fostering it and keeping it going I think that's the most important thing. Well, that's that's, that's an inspiring, inspiring words, Kim. I mean, so what drew you to crime? I mean, and and the timing was absolutely perfect to be part of the possibly the first wave of this this major uh, sort of uh, genre shift within the overall genre of psychological thrillers. Uh, not taking um, the place of the many other areas of that, the cosy crime, the golden age, and uh, and serial killer uh, aspects of of the overall uh, crime world. But what 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 made you move towards? domestic noir as i believe it's called now well i think um I, i've always been drawn uh, to ordinary people and the thing the 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 books that i enjoy the most when i'm reading crime especially psychological are the ones where you know it almost seems possible i like things to seem possible um so and i mean i was brought up in kirkby and ashfield and it, which is a, a you know, mining area, surrounded by mining areas. And, and like with my young adult fiction as well, I write about a lot about working class or, um, you know, people who are perhaps struggling in some areas of their life. And it's really the ordinary person thing. And, and that's why I enjoy, I enjoy reading those books uh, that cover that. And I enjoy writing them as well, because I like it to be believable. I, I like ordinary people in situations where uh you know things start going wrong as long as it's not my own life you understand <laughs> I like that in the life of others <laughs> people often ask me about the, the, the difference between crime and psychological thrillers because I, I i write both yeah. and for me i think largely um i mean it, they are you know a domestic setting largely but it's I think really they're very, very similar, except I always say the psychological thriller is, is from the point of view of the person being affected by the crime rather than about the police investigation and the outside things. Um, other, other than that, I think they are quite similar genres. I, th I think you're right. I, th I, th I think that's correct. And, and I always think like it must be really hard to write a police procedure because you've got to have that, you know, in-depth knowledge of um, forensics and of You just police. pretend, Kim, it's quite easy. You just, just, just make it up as you go along. <laughs> well, that's true because in psychological people say, oh, have you got any experience of this? And well, no, I haven't. But, you know, I, the, the, the mind is a very... Um, a very broad and uh you know you can't really label a lot of things psychological and, and like you say you know you just sort of like imagine and, and make it up so i guess yeah it's probably the, the same sort of thing 
Uh, readers coming to your work for the first time, where would you guide them to look? Which book would you guide them to first? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, well, since Safe With Me, I think um, my books have, have got... I think Safe With Me is kind of like probably the strangest one in a way, although I do like strange characters, but the the, the protagonist, Anna, is, is rather strange in Safe With Me. So I'd say as a as a sort of benchmark of my books, something like Blink or Liar or The Mistake, they're, they're all quite... Uh, similar in that they might have odd characters in because I really like odd characters but the, the protagonist perhaps is is not as odd uh, whereas safe with me um you know she she is very odd full stop the protagonist so I think my books have um have developed so that uh, I might have odd people in them but the protagonist is quite you know even more of an ordinary person um so so any of them really but safe with me uh, was a, a little bit more strange I think as a lead character I mean, is that a route that you you like the kind of the I suppose I don't know, you say odd I mean would, would you count that as a, an unlikable protagonist because I know there's a lot of talk at the moment about having a likable protagonist and an unlikable one um I mean, there's a, there's, a, you know, there's a there's a lot of debate over that at the moment my protagonists in the psychological thrillers tend to be quite kind of unreliable not very likable people but um I think there's there's a certain um intrigue isn't there into reading about people like that and actually you know we we assume that Everyone assumes that they themselves are nice and that, you know, other people are kind of a mixture of both. But I mean, getting into the head of someone who perhaps isn't, you know, is, is flawed and has their issues, it, it can it can be quite interesting, can't it? Absolutely. And that's the that's the bit that I really enjoy. I I like um, unreliable and sometimes unlikable protagonists. But I think for the author, for the writer, you have to strike a bit of a balance. I think with Safe With Me, Anna was a protagonist who um, lots of people didn't like, but she was intriguing, I think. And um, you know, I hope that that keeps people turning the pages. But I think if there's a bit too much of that, sometimes, uh, you know, when you're in the dark recesses of someone's mind, if, if that's your protagonist, uh, you have to be careful not to give the book too um, too low or too depressing of a mood, if you see what I mean. So I found that I prefer it. Um, I mean, some of my protagonists are unlikable and, uh, you know, people have found them unlikable, but uh, draw even more on the sort of Every, everyday person kind of um, character who may or may not be unlikable and it doesn't mean to say that they're not flawed and it doesn't um, you know it doesn't it's not revealed that they're they're actually really disturbed or unlikable if you see what I mean absolutely mm. uh, and you you also draw from uh, the city uh, in which you live which is 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 Nottingham um, and set most of your books uh, in in that area again writing from what you know uh, is that the reason uh, uh, looking out the window walking to the local shops catching driving into town or whatever is it easier to actually set your uh, your thrillers in the next street uh, as opposed to actually setting them abroad or somewhere that you don't know so well. Yeah, well, I think uh, I'm a big fan of Nottingham as a city anyway. So am I. I love, I've, worked there, I've worked there a lot and I, I absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah, and, and I love it and, and I'm, you know, I, I'm very fond of Nottingham. But I think what it is is that when I'm imagining in my mind, I always get the character voice through first and then I start to pair it I sort of simmer it a bit. I call it simmering. And I, I simmer the character with uh, perhaps um, an idea that I've had or a couple of ideas. And then um, I start to think about that for a while before I'm writing. And scenes, you know, I can see things, I can see scenes developing in my head. And it's nearly always somewhere that I know or it's always somewhere in Nottingham. And I've always been uh, the same with that. So it's not that I think uh, I write what I know. Um, I don't think, you know, that's the, the best way to do it because I, I don't think that's the case. I think you can set books anywhere as a writer. But uh, they they always, scenes always locally seem to come to me and I just stick with that and, and it seems to have worked quite well. And it doesn't seem to, you know, people 
I don't think it excludes readers because it's set in a city. And I think for, you know, what sort of worldwide appeal, I try not to get too bogged down in the setting, even though it's it's um, quite important. Uh, but in some ways, it could be any city in the world, you know, like when I'm describing the streets. And I try not to have too many colloquialisms in there. I mean, I do often sly in um, an A up me duck. <laughs> <laughs> You know that, that, that's our local saying, and we're all very proud of that. So, you know, I may I may slide that in once or twice, but um, I try and um, and keep it um, for broad appeal, really. But uh, but using the Nottingham uh, setting as a background. Well, that's interesting. Being inside people's heads, we're just talking about you know you you write very strange characters, uh, and and you enjoy that. I mean, it's quite interesting because I've spent 40 years nearly as an actor. So uh, I've, I've very often brought home some very strange people inside my head from work. <laughs> um, how do you find that, actually living inside the head of, of, of a, when you're really working and developing on a character and writing a character? Uh, do you find it, it changes you? Do, do people around you, loved ones, go, uh-oh? <laughs> you know, who, who's, who's she today? Who's she working on today? Or do you manage to actually just sort of uh, sort of leave it uh, at the at the laptop and uh, and go about your business? Do you know what I find it really hard to leave it at the laptop? And um, I became a full time writer in summer two thousand fifteen, so it's uh, not quite three years yet. Um, but uh, what I didn't anticipate is that. I had a day job and I used to write early in the morning and, and at evenings and weekends. What I didn't anticipate with writing at home, and I, I try and keep it confined to uh, the office, the spare bedroom, um, but I find it really hard to tear myself away from it. And the best way to do it, when I say away from it, I mean the writing, but really I mean the characters. So um, what I've found is that I'm far better to um, finish what I'm doing and then get out of the apartment and, and, and actually physically remove myself. Because otherwise, what I find happens is I either work too many hours, you know, just like, um, I mean, you'll, you'll know this entirely that you look at the clock and can't believe how many hours I've gone um, uh, until I hear my, my husband tentatively scraping at the door with a cup of tea or something. <laughs> then I remember that there's a real world out there. It is really odd that only writers can really understand. But um, I find that if I don't get my, remove myself physically from the environment, I, found I, I have a period whereby I've got one foot in the fictional world and one foot you know, out of it, and I can appear distracted, which some people may feel is quite a strange. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, oh, I, I know that one at all. I mean, my, if my daughter say it once, they've said it a hundred times. Daddy, 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 <laughs> can, can he, he, uh, dad's off. He's, 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 he's sitting there, and you, 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 we call it in a brown study. Dad's in his study, and uh, in Gibraltar. In they, his mind. They, they bring me, bring me back to it, bring me back to the present in, in no uncertain terms. They've, they've got very skilled at that. I mean, that's fascinating, isn't it? The, the, the worlds a writer's mind goes in because you know you, you, you're in not only one character, you're in so many different characters, and not only that, you're in different environments which you have to have to create. I mean, your story is 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 is, is as I said. A, a, very inspiring uh, and I hope uh, any would be writers listening to this uh, will just go well look, this is possible and as usually it comes down to absolute dedication uh, self-belief and hard graft mm. and you seem to have personified uh, 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 that in uh, and uh, one of the reasons why you have been so successful and you have been now when did that really take off did 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 you find the match with your publisher that sort of uh, really sort of catapulted this this forward uh, did they get behind you straight away and just say, right, OK, here we go. We love your work. We want that, that, that. I mean, that's a, any writer's dream, isn't it? And did that yes. dream happen to you? Yes, it did. And, you know, as I say, it's 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 years and years. I mean, with my, with my young adult, I got the I got the publishing contract with um, Macmillan. Um, but when I decided I wanted to go back to adult crime, my agent um submitted it but I'd already got a good friend who was a an author with Booker Chow. I think you may have heard of her, Angela Marsons oh yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, she was a guest uh, two or three weeks back yes the, yes 
we have Angela and her parrot. Uh, well, that was a, that was a, that was a great interview too. Her parrot talks more than she does sometimes. <laughs> I think uh, they managed to gag the poor thing for most of the interview, but we 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 we, we felt its presence. <laughs> so I knew about Booker Chore um, even before they sort of took the digital world by storm, really. Um, and uh, I'd known um, Angie for many years when we were both unpublished and we always kept in touch. And um, and uh, so my agent uh, submitted to Booker Chore and they snapped up safe with me. Now, that was a dream come true. And I signed for, I think I signed for three books in the first contract. And I was so, you know, it was just, an amazing experience because Safe With Me was very, very successful and then the subsequent books have been. And and um, I just feel that I found my niche. I found something that I absolutely adore reading and writing, you know, this genre that I'm in at the moment. Um, and um, and because I've written the books in quick succession, I've, I've, I've just signed my third contract with Booker Chaw. So I'm writing... I'm just about to, well, The Secret, The Visitor was uh, published at the beginning of March. And the Secret is now up for pre-order and that's published at the end of July. So I'm just about to embark on book seven, unbelievably. And I joined Booker Chore in November 16. So that gives you an idea of the pace that I'm at and, it, and it's and it's too much to sustain you know for year after year after year and I'm just coming to the end of that really intense period and I'm just going to be slacking off to three books a year <laughs> just slack. well that's uh, I mean is that is that workload sort of uh, uh, come from book do they say we we want these books and we need them by so and so uh, is that is that sort of do they drive that sort of uh, they they really of... don't. I mean, I, you know, I've always been driven myself. And what Booker Chore explained at the beginning was that as an author uh, starting out, um, as, as Adam's already said, you know, I think it was Adam and not Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't me. Mind you, I don't know what you're about to say. So well together, <laughs> but it won't be me. Blur in after a while. These lovely voices at the. Uh... <laughs> so we tend to blend. Bob one of you said about the you know the psychological thriller thing that took off well i kind of feel as though i joined booker chore just almost at the crest of the wave because of course you know we've got so many out there now i just kind of felt that i joined you know at the end of this not at the end because i don't think we're at the end but i think i i and the swell of of psychological um thrillers coming out um so what they explained was with with a new author, yeah, it is to your advantage in in building readership if if you can sort of write books uh, on the quicker side, because we're talking about digital here, aren't we? So we're talking about uh, people who enjoy reading books on their Kindle or other e-read, and you know it's almost. And I've been there; I'm a massive Kindle fan, so I'd read a book that's not expensive and then move on to the next one, and. Um, and I know that, you know, there, there are so many great authors out there and so many great books that um, it's important to keep your name in the reader's mind. They don't want to wait too too long before your next one. So it was a strategy, definitely, that Booker Chaw, um, uh, sort of flagged up. Uh, but... Uh, they do very much leave it to the author to decide uh, the pace they want to write. Now, to give you an idea, I, I signed up to two books a year and I ended up writing four. So, you know, I'm a glutton for punishment, really. <laughs> I just can't um, say that Bookshaw cracked the whip. I, I, I cracked the whip far harder with myself. I, that's my personality. I always have done. And, um, you know, I'm now at the stage where um, I'm, I'm now ready to just, like I say, you know, Take up knitting or something. Three books a year. I mean, I'll be sitting about. Can I, I can't quite <laughs> see any scarves or jumpers being available for Christmas. I can probably see yet another book. Um, uh, and thank goodness for that. Can you tell us a bit about the visitor, which is uh, was published in March? It's your latest book. The, the secret is out in July. But uh, people uh, who want to uh, obviously go out and, and snap up your books. Um, uh, tell us the story of the visitor. Well, the visitor um, is is about. Uh, I got to, to start with the the writing of the visitor. Really, is that I got these a strange character in my head. First of all, um, the there's a male there's a male character. Often my protagonists are female, but there's a male character, David, um, who is um, is quite a an oddball person, and and he's he's had a bit of. Um, 
upheaval in his own life and he's, he spends a lot of time in his his bedroom upstairs he's a man in his 40s who lives with his mother are we getting a picture we are yeah i'm, I'm, I'm there with you <laughs> yeah <laughs> he, li- he lives with his his mother on um on baker crescent but uh, basically he's got a very staid um scheduled life and he likes to keep an eye on his neighbors and um something that happened to him he sees it as a sort of a a watchful eye and anyway there's a new girl comes into town and a a new woman comes into town holly and um and she's got a bit of a turbulent past and uh, she 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 meets david and they strike up an unlikely friendship um but all all i can say is all's not as it seems so um you know people have got dark secrets and are hiding things and and the tension builds and uh sort of builds and builds and a sense of dread and there we are back in the collector so that you have the the the, the wonderful usual uh, chaos slated combination of uh, of, of tension fast pace and 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 creeping creeping suspense uh so i mean that now that's the visitor that's out uh now uh, uh people may have buy it on kobo uh i am certainly going to get that uh, that one and the secret is out in in july um so i mean and and after that you've actually slated your your, your next book for later on in the year or is it going to be a jumper and a scarf um, no, it's definitely the next book is slated for the end of the year, and I'm going to be starting that very shortly. Um, but um, it might, there might be a scarf, but nothing more than that, I don't think. <laughs> um, and, then, and then, yeah, so I've been publishing sort of one book roughly every three months with Book of Chalk for some time now, and um, and I, I'm going to be doing about three books a year. So, um yeah, I'm not. I'm not really slacking off that much, no, but it's far more manageable. Just moving part time instead. <laughs> yeah, I'm just you know, sort of, uh, trying to rediscover the world outside the office door mm. thing a bit more, because mm. I don't think it's a very attractive feature in a writer when you finish work and that you're, you know, the, the characters in your head are taking over the the real life people, and we laugh about it, but um, you know, it, it is sometimes difficult to keep that boundary. Uh, when your work is in your head and your characters are very real, you know it's difficult to keep that boundary sometimes, and um, and that's how I've found working full time. You know, it's been my dream for many years, and then when you actually get it, it is wonderful, and it's absolutely what I want. But I never imagined it would writing would take try and take over my life as much as it has. It's so, vital to have that little thing called real life as well, isn't it? Sometimes. It's quite grounding. Mm. Yes, that lovely mm. time at around about six o'clock. A little wine, a little wine o'clock. Mm-hmm. P.G. Woodhouse always used to stop for a cocktail in the later late afternoon, but then he used to go back to work in the evening. He had an extraordinary uh, a, a way of working, and each writer has their their very own pattern. But you've described your uh, writing life so wonderfully well, Kim, uh, and thank you, and uh, and also your work. And uh, hopefully, uh, all our uh, listeners are going to rush out and start buying your psychological thrillers. Uh, uh, I, I know I am, and uh, you've described your life very well, and the dedication and hard work that it actually takes to be a best-selling uh, uh, crime novelist. Uh, you you epitomise that, and, uh, and, and I, you know, that's a fantastic story. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us. I hope you'll come back and talk to us uh, maybe later on in the year when the, when the new books are out and we can, we can catch up. By that time, maybe you've managed to get something from Booker Chew that isn't a parrot, maybe an, an elephant or, <laughs> uh, uh, or, or, or whatever. We, we we think that's a we think that's a great selling thing that mm. uh, the crime writers with their pets um, maybe we'll start a line on that see see, see who their favourite pets are but uh, it, it, do you have a pet by the way do you have a cat or a dog I don't have a pet at the moment but I'm a I'm a very big dog fan ah, uh, I love so dogs yeah. I haven't got a dog at the moment my daughter's got one so I you know I project all my dog love onto onto her at the moment oh well. what, what's what's the dog's name. Her name is <laughs> Marilyn. Marilyn. What a Marilyn. I, l- I love animals that have human names. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Well, she's a blonde chihuahua, you see. Oh, oh I see. She's a blonde chihuahua, so it's absolutely perfect. Well, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. I prefer that to humans who should have animal names. <laughs> we, we know a few of them. I've met a few of those too. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Kim. You've been a wonderful guest. Thanks very much for ju- for joining us. And uh, best of luck, not that you need it. You create your own uh, with uh, your books and your future writing and speak to you later on in the year.
Thanks so much. Lovely to chat. Take care. And here's hoping as well that uh, the new book tips you over that million mark. A million copies sold. Yeah, I hope so. It will. Fingers crossed for you. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks ever so much, guys. Well, all of uh, K.L. Slater's books are available on Kobo. You should absolutely go and get those. The uh, The most recent book, um, The Visitor, the Visitor is, uh, was out in March, and The Secret is available to uh, to pre-order already as well. So go over to Kobo.com, find those books, and if you are new to Kobo, then they will give you 90% off of your first book purchased from them. Which is, I think, a very good offer, don't you? It is, yeah. And uh, another great interview. We say it every time. Oh, but, well, uh, we do because I mean, you know, this is this is the reason we, we do this podcast because yeah. you know, getting into the minds and, and listening to the experiences and stories of of crime writers uh, throughout the world. Um, uh, next week we've got a, a very interesting uh, contribution from uh, the Southern Hemisphere, which we will talk about later on. Uh, but it is always fascinating. Everyone has their own story. Everyone has their own uh, journey and. I think people find that very, very interesting. I, well, I hope they do. I certainly do. Yeah, we were talking about this in my, my kitchen, weren't we? When we had a we had that obligatory cup of tea and coffee before we start recording. We uh, what we call our, um, our 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 production meeting beforehand, which is yes. basically me making a cup of tea and us just uh, looking out on your garden yeah. and admiring your latest <laughs> water feature and, and having a chat about what we're what we're going to be covering in in that day's show. And um, yeah, we, we, we were talking about what makes the guests so interesting because they're, they're all crime writers or they're all crime actors or um, directors involved somehow or um, true crime. Um, yeah, moments sort of. We've but, had that, you know, experts on poison and, and various other things. But they've all got unique stories of, of how they got there, and they've all got you know even even though that the kind of the theme is similar that runs through they they've all got very human very unique stories I mean we had Kim there talking about how she'd um, she'd been rejected for years by publishers she went off to university at the age of 40 to learn how to how to write proper in it and then <laughs> um, and then and then managed to get these these wonderful two publishing deals and you know we had Angela Marsons as well she'd been rejected for 20 odd years I think before she was picked up and it's it, there are just these unique very human stories that well as through. I said in an interview I mean these are the stories that people you know would be writers and people who are writing and, and have started writing or even if they've been writing for very many years and have not got anywhere suffering the rejection that uh, both the, of those authors said they experienced I mean they're, they're, they're inspiring stories because they do show that you know you can uh, you know you've got to be a good writer let's let's not forget that your stories have got to be good you know well, uh, we've done okay without that uh, <laughs> Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say of, vital. <laughs> slight of hand, <laughs> and uh, uh, but it's sort of you know. It's I think these stories are important, and uh, and hopefully uh, some of our listeners who uh, are that way inclined and maybe struggling themselves and trying to get their first book away, or or trying to find a publisher, or, or decide as to to go their own way as an indie writer, uh, they'll you know they'll take note of that and uh, and carry on carrying on. Well, if you have a story you want to share or a story you want to hear, somebody you'd like us to speak to or just something you want to tell us please do yes. get in touch email hello at partnersincrime.online our website is partnersincrime.online we're on facebook facebook.com forward slash partners in crime podcast and our twitter is crime fic podcast uh, i think that i'll do for this week don't you yeah i think that's uh, it's time for another coffee and another look at your water feature oh, i beg your pardon uh, and he's done the fencing um listeners that may be interesting to you or so it's going to be a new feature now, the, the Adam Croft Garden update. We've got well, Hugh Fraser's restaurant reviews that, um, well, that appear occasionally. I mean, you have a touch of the titch marsh in you. You really do. It's gardener's well, question time. I've, uh, got, I've got a cream for that. Uh, <laughs> well, you've certainly got some very nice fencing, and I think we should leave it at that. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Beish. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Perfected.